Alright guys, um, kind of unexpected this one, um, I haven't checked my setup for a little while, could somebody out there if you're watching please, just uh, double check this, can, tell me if you can hear me okay, I don't know if the audio is coming through. Hopefully one of you out there will respond in a minute if anybody's watching. If you are, do tell me if you can hear my voice or whether I need to adjust my audio settings, please. I'm not sure if I've checked it for a while, so... Just, um... Got a browse, hang on. If you are, do tell me if you can hear my voice or whether I need to adjust my audio settings, please. Seems fine. Do, do, do. Close that. Right. Okay. Right, if you've been here before, guys, you know the drill. Um, when it comes to uh, doing these videos, I have to... Uh, I have to wait a couple of minutes to make sure everything's initialised and check how everything looks before we go on. Testing, testing, exactly. Can you hear me, guys? Can you hear me okay? Please just quickly type yes if you can. Excellent. So, thank you, mate. Appreciate that. Hope you're doing well. Um, hope you're all doing well. In light of recent announcements and whatever else is going on. <laughs> um, anyway, let's dot this down a couple of notches so I can hear myself anyway. Right, so, um, hi, how's it going, guys? Um, welcome back to another Yam Yam Retro Gaming live stream. I haven't done one now for a few weeks. I've been up to a lot of little projects here and there. Uh, I've also had a bit of uh, aggro going on regarding uh, where I store all my gear. So, I'm trying to get over all that at the moment. So, forgive me if I've not been doing a lot of videos, but it's purely because I've been either working heavily on projects, trying to prep stuff for the videos, or I've been otherwise occupied trying to get everything done. Um, we're now up to the 26th of September. And um, looks like we're going to be in this Corona thing for the long haul. So you'll be seeing a lot more videos from me during this time. Um, I fill my time quite happily playing games uh, during the whole lockdown thing. And uh, it looks like the conditions are going to be up and down for a while. It's going to be a quiet Christmas. So indulging in your hobby is a good way of getting over those Corona blues anyway. So... Um, I hope you're all doing okay. Uh, if you are struggling, please just get involved in your hobby. Just have a game, share some videos, just share a bit of what you're doing, have a laugh. You know, we're all struggling. Just kind of get over it and just indulge in something you enjoy and you'll, you'll feel a lot better about yourself. Um, so anyway, um, I've got a video for you today, something quite special. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how it came about and uh, what I'm going to be covering Um and today we are going to be covering this. This is, and you have to excuse me because I've got to back out quite a bit to get this in shot. This is the Nintendo Super Famicom box system. And uh, you'll have to forgive the way I've got this rigged up. I've had to kind of, it's one of the most hardest things I've had to film because of just how much, how huge this damn system is. And I can't actually do a lot to zoom in or zoom out on this. So, yeah, I'm, I'm doing as best I can to kind of get this in shot. But, uh, yeah, there is the system underneath my laptop, which I've had to perch on top while I'm doing this, just so I can get it all in shot. Um, the thing is huge. It is about the size of a CDI. It's about the size of an old video, probably bigger. In fact, I had the old VCR out recently uh ripping some videos and it was not i actually had that sat on top of this and this thing absolutely dwarfed it um so um what is it right well the super famicom box for those of you out there who don't know is something of a grail pickup for nintendo fans especially if you're a massive super nintendo fan like i am uh, people who know me know that the 
SNES is my favourite ever system, um, and uh, it just it holds you know a, a special place for me because it was the time that the eight bits took the leap to sixteen bit. It was the only time that Nintendo led the generation in terms of technology. And uh, the SNES is one of the finest console, well, the finest console ever made, if, in my personal opinion. And uh, when it comes to collecting things, people know that I like to collect my hardware. And the more obscure and strange, the better. Now, this thing uh, is not something that, that too many people are actually aware of existing. Uh, it was created in the early 90s, possibly a year or two after the launch of the Super Nintendo in Japan and um, well so the super famicom in japan and uh, it was created as an entertainment center for use in uh, hotels leisure complexes and places like that um, anybody who's familiar with the um the ne the nintendo sorry the nes m82 demo system this thing operates on a very similar basis uh, what a lot of people aren't aware of is there was a predecessor to this which is very similar to the M82 shop kiosk demo system, simply called the Famicom Box. Uh, and what that what was very similar to the uh, M82 system, it held a total of 15 cartridges, but they were custom NES cartridges, um, and they work on a paper time uh, allocation system. So you literally would put your coins into a coin box, which was mounted on the side, and you would pay for allocated time. And the idea was that obviously travelling businessmen, you know, travelling gamers had something to play in their hotels after a long day at conferences or conventions or whatever else they were doing. Um, and a lot of hotels in Japan did snap this up. You wouldn't have seen this kind of thing work over here, not in the 90s. You know, people weren't as familiar with hotel entertainment and things like that back then. Not like now where you've got your pay-per-view and, you know, you've got your smart TVs and that in your hotel rooms. Uh, but I would have killed to have got something like this over here back in the day. Um, well, as it happened, these things continued in Japan for uh, a good three or four years in their heyday. And um, they lasted for the duration of the, the Super Famicom's popularity in Japan. And a lot of hotels bought them up. But obviously, once they reached retirement, they kind of started to find their ways into skips, unfortunately. Now, a lot of people, thankfully had the good sense to retain these things, realise their worth as, as, as a curiosity and a collector's item, and started selling them to the general public. These were never sold to the general public, um, but they started to then make their way outside of Japan. Now, the first... I, I heard rumours of these back in the day because I'd heard of things like the uh, the Sega Mega Jet, which, of course, was like a Mega Drive plug-in system they used on Japanese airlines back in the day. Um, and similar systems like that. There was a, a similar Super Nintendo based one, but I've never seen one of those released to the public. Um, this system I heard rumoured about, but I never saw in the flesh. And it was only in recent years when people really started to dig that people started to turn up uh, these systems. And uh, if you dig around online, there is not an awful lot of information online about them. So, what is it? Well, I'm just going to go back to my screen here for a second. Just to give my arm a rest, because it's a bit of a pain holding this up while I do it. Well, the system itself it is essentially a, a Super Famicom Japanese SNES system. Uh, custom hardware put into a box. It's not just like, you know, some other systems where they've just shoehorned a base, you know, console into... A box and then package it all together and then off you go uh, it's actually custom hardware uh, but it does borrow some elements from an original Super Famicom so inside the system you've got a main board which has got your you know your PPU chips on your CPU and everything like that uh, you've got a separate section for the controllers which is mounted off to one side uh, and then you've got a custom additional board that goes on the back which handles the coinage, it handles the system BIOS, it handles all your settings, and it's actually battery backed up to save things like the time and date for record keeping. Um, and the system itself uses rather odd and rather ungainly uh, huge custom cartridges. So whereas your kind of arcade systems that worked on a similar principle 
would use custom custom cartridges. I understand that. Anybody who's ever seen a Nintendo Play Choice arcade machine, they used like long kind of RAM boards which plug into a board rather than actual NES cartridges. But you can get like a NES adapter to use NES games on it. The Neo Geo uh, MVS system, the, the, they use the M, they the MVS cartridges and the slightly different pinned AES cartridges for home systems. Uh, but they were essentially the same cartridge and you could get a converter to allow that. Um, similarly with the uh, the Sega Megatech, uh, the cartridges were very similar to Japanese Mega Drive cartridges but it was a completely different pinout system uh, and it just used like a 10 bank of cartridge slots. But you could get an adapter and you can still get an adapter to use original Mega Drive carts. Even though there's extra functions going on in terms of the coinage and calling up instruction sheets and things like that. That was essentially what they are. This, however, is completely different. And I'm going to quickly power off the system just so you can see exactly what's going on inside. So let's flip this to off. There we go. So the system is now off. And uh, I'm just going to delve inside this beast of a thing and show you what's going on. So... You can see on the front there we've got two barrel locks at the top. Now the key for these has unfortunately long been lost. Uh, and that's just an unfortunate um, unfortunate thing about time. You know, these things do get lost over time. And um, I'm just going to have to reach down here for a second and power this off at the wall. Yeah, this is an unfortunate thing about these systems over time. They, um, they unfortunately, you know, things like the keys and that service keys, much like arcade machines, get lost. And quite often those got lost. So uh, when you get tend to pick up one of these, you tend to find that that key is missing, unfortunately. Uh, and those keys were missing on mine. But thankfully, uh, I was able to get into it because uh, it actually uses game bit screws on the bottom on exposed hinges. So what I was able to do was actually able to completely remove all the hinges, lift it off at the bottom, and you can actually kind of prise these away from the catches at the top uh, in the kind of reverse fashion. And then once you do, you can turn the tabs around on the back and you can leave it open. So at the moment, this is currently completely open. And if we look inside, this is what we're dealing with. So on the left there, we've got, it's basically just a plastic hole uh, which houses two uh, Super Famicom controllers. The controllers themselves are standard Super Famicom controllers. There's nothing strange about these. There's no custom chips or anything inside. Um, but what a lot of people did think is that they're hardwired into the system. They're not actually hardwired. They've got an extremely long uh, internal cable. I think you've got about six feet or more on these cables. And there's a second uh, controller in there. And I'm going to fish that out at the moment now. Um, and they just go through two little holes at the back. Now, people thought that those holes were like hardwired into the system. When you actually take the shell off this thing, behind there is much like the original snares. There's two cartridge ports at the back and they do plug in like normal. So the good news is that if the, the controllers ever go in these, you could just use standard Super Famicom controllers or you could basically take this controller apart, retain the wire and the, the plug-in connects there. So you've got the super long wires and you could change these for, you know, nice new Super Famicom controllers. It's quite good as well because a lot of stuff that comes from Japan tends to be very yellowed. Uh, they have a big thing there about smoking in close capacity to their consoles, leaving them in direct sunlight, and a lot of stuff from Japan does arrive yellowed. Thankfully, mine aren't too bad. This is, I think this is the worst of the two controllers. And as you can see, see that's still pretty clean. And the good thing is with this one, uh, it's not seen a lot of use or it seems to be in service because you've still got nice springy L and R buttons, uh, still returning like normal. It's very clean. I've given it a bit of a clean up myself, but it is very clean and um, the buttons are nice and responsive. The D pad's nice and responsive, so quite happy about that. As we move over to the side here, this is where all the special stuff starts to happen. So on the front, we have a reset switch. If I just flip this up for a second you'll see there is a game and TV switch, uh, a reset switch. The uh, writing, unfortunately, has worn off a little bit on that. Uh, we've got two LED indicators indicating TV or game, depending on which mode you're on. And we have a key switch on the far right-hand side. Uh, now, I've had to remove the key temporarily while I show you this because 
unfortunately you can't uh, open the front with the keys because the key uh, the keyhole just kind of stays right there so let's take that off for a second and those two things you see at the top there those are the cartridges so if I just quickly pull these tabs here at the side you can see you've got this absolute beast of a thing there and I'm gonna to have to back up just to show you the cartridge this is the cartridge for a Super Famicom box it is an absolute beast of a thing now I haven't got my Neo Geo cartridges just to show you as a comparison but I can tell you now that these things dwarf the Neo Geo cartridges they're not nearly as heavy they're not nearly as um, you know they don't, they're not like a, a huge slab of a thing. They're a lot thinner than the Neo Geo cartridges. But they are certainly a lot, lot bigger. And uh, you can see uh, the thickness of them there. They're a little bit thicker than uh, a SNES cartridge. Uh, not massively thicker. But they are, like, basically one of these is about the size of four SNES cartridges. So you can get, get an impression of how large they are. And uh, the way these cartridges work... Um, there's two cartridges, um, and there are, but there aren't that many games made for the system. And unfortunately, you can't actually customize it to add any more games. I'll go into that a little more in a second. So, the first cartridge you'll get with most of these systems, and it is an essential cartridge, is this one. This uh, cartridge contains three games. It's called the PSS-61 cartridge. And um, they are custom licensed. There's a serial number on all of these, which is supposed to go with certain systems. I think it was a way of controlling who'd leg legitimately purchased their cartridges uh, back in the day. Um, but uh, this first cartridge has three games on, uh, and it's got so it's got Star Fox, Super Mario Kart, and the third one there is actually Super Mario Collection, which is the Japanese name for Mario All Stars. And you can see the copyright. Uh, copyrights down there say 1992 1993 nintendo so you get a feel for when this actually came out uh, now these are three of the premium titles for the system um i'll come to all the questions in a minute guys bear with me um but this cartridge is essential and it's labeled in red to mark it as essential because this also contains the bios information that controls how the entire system works so you even though this system has a potential to hold a total of five games over two cartridges, these three games have to make their way on there because this contains the BIOS information for the system. The system won't actually power up without this cartridge installed. And uh, if you ever do pick up one of those, bear that in mind that if it doesn't contain the red PSS61 cartridge, it won't work at all. And then you can see there's a secondary slot here. It doesn't matter which way around you put the cartridges, you can put... That one at the top or the bottom it still reads that one first if i just pop this one out it just helps you remove them this is the pss 64 cartridge now what's quite cool about this cartridge um up until a couple of years ago this was a, a rumored cartridge in that uh, it didn't it wasn't known to have actually been officially released until a couple of years ago and a few collectors actually had them in their collections um, they're a bit more obscure than the other cartridges there were a total of four cartridges released that people know of to this day there was the PSS 61 which I've just shown you there was the PSS 62 which contained two games you really wouldn't care about uh, that well, I think it was some kind of Super Wily Go uh, Golf I think it is and uh, Super Mayong 2. Now here in the West, we've got no time for Mayong games. So that cartridge is a bit of a bust. Then there was a PSS 63 cartridge. And that is the one most people tend to go for when they look for these systems. Uh, and that system actually holds um, Super Donkey Kong, which is Donkey Kong Country in Japan. And um, the other game is Super Tetris 2, which contains Bombliss as well. So... Uh, yeah, that is the, the one most commonly found, the PSS 63 cartridge. This, however, is the best of all the cartridges, and I'm glad I managed to find it. Um, I didn't get this with the system. I actually found this separately on Japanese auctions, and that's something else I'll be coming to shortly. Um, this is the PSS 64, and it contains, uh, super again, Super Donkey Kong. So why they didn't go with another game, I'm not sure. 
so Donkey Kong Country and Super Bomb Man 2, uh, which is a fantastic game uh, on the Super Nintendo. Super Bomb Man on the SNES is actually what my favourite Bomb Man of all the Bomb Mans that were made. And number two is a very good successor to it. They did slowly decrease in quality over time. I think there were five in all together on the SNES. But Super Bomb Man 2 is a really good one. And uh, that, is, that is what you find on this cartridge. So it is the best cartridge out there. And I'm really glad to have found this. Because these cartridges, as you can imagine, with the systems being quite obscure, don't turn up all that often. Um, quite often these would have been removed and lost. Um, the systems themselves have been salvaged by you know resellers in Japan, but not not always the games or as the games would have failed because they are proprietary, um, they would have been thrown away. Now you can see at the bottom of the cartridge here that is the connector it uses. It's 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 something ridiculous. I think it's like an eighty pin connector or something like that. It's very similar to uh, an IDE connector, but you can see like the notches on the top. Uh, so you think about the old IDE hard drives and things like that would have been, you know, one of those notches in the centre and then that block there, what would have been 40 pin, I think it was. So this this is either an 80 or a 100 pin or something stupid like that. Yeah, I can probably play this back and actually tell you, but it's got this massive connector on the back. And as you push these into the system, they literally just plug into the back of the system there. And I'll try and get inside the hole now I've got this open. And show you what's going on inside there. So you can see at the back there, there are two, uh, there's a, a, like a riser board coming out of the main board. And uh, you can see the two IDE slots there that the cartridges plug into. Uh, what else is going on inside there? That is the actual main board for this there, you can see. And there's a few wires coming out of this. There's the extension cables there, which run to the cartridge ports. Those are the coloured cables with the white connector. Those yellow cables there, they come out to the front in out panel. And they would also there's also a few extra connectors there. They would actually run out to the side here. Uh, this used like a proprietary kind of coin box, um, and that panel there on the side can actually be removed. And the coin box, if you look at some of the pictures of this system online, you'll see it came with like a, a really tiny kind of coin box that went on the side that just accepted 100 yen coins, I think it was. Uh, and then obviously you can set it in the BIOS to control how long you get for 100 yen um, but it does mean that accessing this system is pretty easily uh, once you get the shell off now one thing i actually documented recently um, on my page was my struggles in getting into this system now the reason it's such a pain in the arse um, is because like i say the system's undocumented so trying to find any information on this is extremely hard to do there's a handful of videos from, you know, about a decade ago um, and a couple of sites that touch on it, but they all seem to have the same information and some of that information is wrong. Um, the, there was one site which mentioned there was a successor to this called the Super Famicom Box 2, uh, which actually used a bank of 10 original Super Famicom cartridges. But when I've actually dug further for that information, I can find no evidence of that system ever actually existing. Um, so whether it was rumoured or whether it was, you know, it might have been the catalogue due to come out at some point, uh, it never actually existed, or at least there's none out in the wild. So finding one of those wouldn't be possible. Um, but um, yeah, even trying to find documentation on this is hard. And the bit of information you do find are from hobbyists like myself who've picked them up, taken them apart, and seen what's going on. Now, uh, a normal game bit screw, uh, game bit screws for anybody who knows, are these pain in the arse things. Uh, the official name for them, if I can try and get this to focus, is uh, line head screws. And they're these weird kind of knobbly head things with notches on the side. And uh, they were made, they, they were chiefly primarily used by Nintendo, but some other console manufacturers too, as security bits to not get inside the consoles. Now in recent years, thankfully, people have started making those bits again for screwdrivers so you can get into these things. And there were two primary sizes. There was the larger... I think it's 4.5 mil bit and the smaller 3.8 mil bit and these are the larger 4.5 mil bits and uh, so I've got a screwdriver that can get into those also the ones on the hinges were the same 4.5 mil what was a problem however if I go down here you can see those are the 4.5 mil ones there that are on the side of the case in the hole there where the fixings are unfortunately uh, and that these are all along the side here, all along the back and on the other side. 
these are a much larger proprietary uh, either 5.5 or 6.5 mil line head screw now the pain in the arse with the hours unfortunately is that uh, those bits are no longer manufactured being as much of a pain in the arse as they are and uh, unfortunately the last few companies that make bits to remove those screws are no longer making them and um, a few people a few years ago did manage to find and specially order a screwdriver for like 25 quid that would remove those but anybody else is there to look I and mean, as luck would have it I've only just picked one of these up um, I couldn't find that bit anywhere I have scoured the internet it was impossible to find and I saw all kinds of you know methods to try and get these things off from needle nose pliers to, to gluing things on to welding nuts onto the top so you could remove them that all seemed a bit nuclear for me um, I needed something I could reuse and some, something I could kind of you know use in the future um, without needing to source identically threaded th uh, threaded screws for these to replace them with so what I actually ended up doing and I, I did briefly show on some of the pictures if you go onto the Yam Yam page you'll see it is I actually took a Dremel with a diamond cutting head and uh, very carefully cut a single slot because they are quite raised heads I cut a single slot into the center of all these screws event uh, essentially turned them into large flathead screws so I was actually able to get inside this thing and uh, take a good look around now the reason I wanted to do that uh, I'll come on to I'll come on to when I pair this pair this up in a second and uh, show you what's going on but I just quickly want to show you um, what's going on around the back if I can get round the back I might not be able to with a laptop here um yeah it's going to be a bit tough like i say filming this thing isn't the easiest thing to do i've got two cameras going on one's on my laptop one's on here they're all wired into each other it's not easy to get around the back um but basically there's not much going on around the back you've basically got a very strange kind of pass-through power supply um obviously a japanese power supply uh which plugs into the wall and then much like the old pcs it's got a secondary port which is with like an output socket and that would allow you to kind of daisy chain plugging the TV into this thing. So you've effectively only got one uh, plug coming from the wall. Um, I guess that was an easy way for them to control pairing up both systems, you know, the TV and the system together. It meant you could probably sit the TV on top of this thing because it is all steel construction. Um, it probably meant you could do that quite easily. And you only had one trailing plug socket. The pain in the arse for that is, is you've got a big bulky power supply in this which doesn't actually need it. The board itself uh, actually runs, there's a cable that comes out of the back of the power, power supply on the back of this uh, and actually plugs into a standard, um, it's, it's like a SNES or a Mega Drive kind of, um, I'm not sure what the millimeter is, power socket uh, and the actual board uses 5 volts and 5 amps of power. It's a lot of power it seems to draw for some reason, but yeah, so you, in theory you could do away with that power supply and use like a laptop uh, 5 volt 5 amp power supply to power this that is what I will actually eventually do at the moment I haven't got one so I've got this feeding down onto the floor into my step down transformer and obviously I'm running this like I would do any other Japanese system <clears throat> but eventually I will remove that power supply and I will, re I will replace it with that system so I can use, at least use a UK plug and it's only drawing the, the very bare minimum that it needs I'll never need to run a, a you know inline 100, 100 volt uh, system to power a Japanese TV off this thing so I can do away with that and save a little bit of the weight the thing itself does weigh a fair bit I think it's 17 kilos or something 17 kilos 17 pounds something like that um, which is about what eight nine ten kilos it does does weigh a fair bit um, and um, yeah so shipping one of these things is is not cheap so I'm gonna go ahead and pop these cartridges back into the system anyway and we'll power this up and I'll show you what's going on. For anybody who's wondering, um, round the back, in terms of ports, all you've got is you've got uh, a coaxial out, a coaxial in, um, and obviously that was designed to pass through the TV through this system. The switch on the front of this console, of course, allowed you to um, switch it so you could switch it between viewing the console or viewing the TV on the TV without actually having to change channels on the TV itself so it was designed to all be fully enclosed and not tampered with in any way um, but yeah uh, we, we don't need any of those um, the most simple way to connect this up is through standard composite RCA 
and that's how it is connected up. I haven't got the best quality leads in it at the moment, but I can tell you the picture is quite acceptable. So we're going to fire this back up now, and I'm going to readjust to the screen, and I can show you exactly what's going on. I'm just going to put my key back in and set this to where it needs to be. Wiggle this to get it back in. There we go. Now, pair this back up. We'll just reposition the camera here on the screen. You can see what's going on. So, when you first pair the system up in this mode, you'll see this screen, which is just a simple, simple loading screen. And uh, basically, all that says there. I've actually had a Japanese friend take a look at this for me. And uh, basically, all that says there is, you know, please wait, system loading. And then when it loads up, you can see there we get this funky uh, background music, and you can see the selection of games we've got to pick from. So uh, we've got the all the games listed here, like I say, not appearing as they do in the order on the cartridge. So Super Mario Kart at the top, uh, Super Mario All Stars, uh, Star Fox, Super Donkey Kong, and Super Bomb Man 2. And if we go into each of those, we can actually uh, we've got a few more options from there. Uh, now I've actually got this at the moment in free play mode. This is complete free play mode. The system's got several different options, which I'll show you a little bit of in a minute. Um, but basically, you need to have the key set to the on switch, and that puts it in free play mode. With this, you wouldn't need the coin box, you wouldn't need the coin slot, you don't need anything. You can just go in, you can play the games as normal. There's no time restrictions, you don't need to input any money, and they're not limited in any way. So we're going to the first game here, so you just use your controller here, press B to pick your game. And then you've got a few options here, and I believe they are, uh, number one is start game, I think number two is view instructions, number three I think is run a demo of it, um, and number four returns you back to the previous menu. You get that same option for all games there. There's actually a fifth option, but that only appears when you're running this in paid mode so uh, that won't actually appear on this mode so we go into the game here and on first boot up the first time you enter the game it gives you this little instruction screen here uh, this basically tells you that these games have actually got a soft reset so if you press uh, both shoulder buttons and select and start at once it will actually soft reset the system back to the the, the title menu uh, and then you can just go back into your game or pick a different game so we'll jump in anyway and as you can see, even though I'm filming this just from, you know, bare camera to screen, and even though this is only a composite picture, I ignore the colour banding you see on the camera, that's not there on the screen. Uh, the picture is actually very, very good. <laughs> and uh, the keen eyed amongst you will notice a few little difference with uh, Mario Kart on here. Um, oh, Donkey Kong's face is missing there. I might not have the cartridge fully inserted, so sorry about that if there's a graphical glitch. Never seen that before. Um, but yeah, there's a few things on the background that are slightly different. Um, the Mario Kart logo is slightly different in Japan. And people know there's some quite famous different poses when the, uh, when the characters actually win on the podium. Uh, Peach and Bowser actually get drunk that you can see them swinging away at the champagne. They don't do that on the Western versions. Uh, one thing I should say is it doesn't matter which of... Even though the, car, the uh, controllers aren't labelled, it doesn't actually matter which controller you pick up. The system will automatically identify the first controller you pick up, the, the first one you actually pick the menu from as controller one. So it doesn't matter which way around you are, it will identify that controller as for player one. So that's quite good. It means you can pick the best of the two controllers to use. And it means you haven't got to fiddle about changing and feeding cables back inside. Um, although, the curiosity with the Japanese Mario Kart, when you first start it, it defaults to two-player mode for some reason. I don't know why that is, but it just defaults to two-player mode. If I go to one-player, you'll see that it does indeed um, see me as player one. And uh, going back a bit, this was, this was always my favourite Mario Kart game. Battle mode on the original Mario Kart was fantastic. 
and you can see here we've got the standard three cups open uh, the rainbow cups not yet open there's a rainbow cup just isn't it and uh, going to the game I can never remember the timing for speed starts because every Mario Kart game the timing for speed start boost is slightly different for every single Mario Kart game and I've been playing the um, the mobile version as well recently so I'm, I'm even more off time because that's really easy to do but yeah I was always towed on the original game not doing too well here I think I'm too used to playing with analog controls now. It's been a while since I've played. Yeah, classic Mario Kart, man. You can't beat it. And it is nice that, of course, obviously this being a Japanese system, these games are all run at 60 hertz, so you've got the proper speed, the music's moving at the proper pace, it doesn't sound all slow like the UK version does. Of course, it does mean running a little bit faster. You've got to kind of get used to the fact that it is a little bit faster than you may have been used to when you were younger. I think the difficulty of a lot of Japanese games is slightly up on what the Western releases were anyway. Actually, I had the ranking for this. <laughs> But anyway, so there you go, that, that's what the game looked like. And obviously, if I now press uh, the four buttons it told me to, it resets the game back to the title screen, which is quite cool. Now, if I want to get out of the game at any point, all I have to do is hit the reset button on the front of the system, like that. And in a few seconds, it will return me back to here. Yeah, bollocks, Davis. It returns you back to the title menu here. And obviously, from there, you can kind of go back into the game you can check the instructions again or you can quit out and pick a different game so I'll just show you a couple of these just to show you they are pretty much identical to their uh, SNES counterparts interesting one of course being uh, Super Mario Collection because obviously that looks quite a bit different in the way it's presented so if you basically if you press a button now rather than call that up in colour like it does on the western one it skips straight to the the opening menu so I'll just wait so you can show you there and of course the game covers look a lot different on here to they do on the uh, the British release because obviously it's a Japanese cover so we've got original Super Mario Brothers original Super Mario Brothers 2 which obviously got known over here as Lost Levels that covers identical but then you've got Super Mario USA which is obviously how we knew Super Mario Brothers 2 uh, and that's obviously the box cover, the box art for it in Japan, and Super Mario 3. And um, I'll go into Super Mario USA because that's the one that's obviously most different. So you've got, so you got the different title screen and everything. And I'll use Princess because she's the cheapest. And of course, the yeah, 80s, Super Mario All Stars, Mario 2. Uh, same rules, same controls. Oh, thanks, though. I did actually cover Doki Doki Panic that this was based on in my um, in my Twin Famicom review. So if you want to go back and check out the different versions of this, um, go back and look at my Twin Famicom video because uh, I did actually cover original Doki Doki Panic and I did cover the uh, original Japanese release of this on the net, on the um, Famicom. ride on that thing <laughs> and of course on here you can save your game now 
The game saving is something I want to mention special, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Right, so I've gone back to the title screen here, and you can see that if I go into the game, and I go back to my game, you can see it has actually saved my game. Now, the, the save slots for all of these games are present, and they do save. So even if I quit out of the game, as I'm now going to do, yeah, even if I do quit out of the game and I go and pick a new game, so for example, we'll jump over now to Donkey Kong Country, because of course that's another one that uses saves. Or Super Donkey Kong, as it's now in Japan. So wonder they never went with that for the Western release, given that every other SNES release got Super as a prefix to its title over the years. Wonder they never went with that for the Western release. But you do get a, quite a nice new title screen for the Japanese release that we didn't get over here. The, the, the English one was a little bit boring. I quite like the Japanese one. There's a lot more going on on there. You can see all the animal helpers and uh, Diddy Kong is a bit more prominent on there. And you can see you can pick a game. You can you know you can pick one or two players and you can go through and save your game just like normal. And again, this game plays just the same. Obviously in 60 hertz, so uh, you get the best of it. You know, it's running at full speed. A little bit quicker, everything in the proper aspect ratio, no letterboxing top or bottom. And me completely sucking at the game. I remember getting this game for Christmas 1994 and I absolutely fucking loved it. So like I say, you've got some premium games on this system, you know what I mean? Donkey Kong Country probably was rated probably the best game on the system in a lot of polls. And obviously you can see the kind of length of time that it covers because uh, Donkey Kong Country, of course, was getting towards the end of the, the SNES's popularity life cycle with the, the fifth generation console starting to arrive at the end of 94, 95. But yeah, it was, you know, it was what really showed off the best of the system, you know, things like Donkey Kong Country. Star Fox is a little bit earlier, but obviously that was uh, something special for the time. So anyway, uh, yeah, what I was showing you is if I go back out of this now and I go back to uh, Mario All-Stars. Can see that it's remembered that I've played the game because it skips the little preview screen that tells me about the software reset. And if I go into it, it's remembered the last game I was on. And if I go into that, there's my save game. However, and this is the big problem with it, if I turn this box off or I um, put it into a different mode on the system, like that, and then switch back. If it was done long enough, of course, hang on. I didn't do it long enough. There you go, put it into admin mode. If I now go back to free play mode, I'll talk about that screen in a minute. see it's now telling me about the uh, soft reset again if I go back to my game you can see it hasn't remembered the last game I played if I go to it unfortunately the save file is completely gone now I just wanted to talk about that because uh, when it when I said it comes about owning this system and looking at the nuances of it the information you get on this system is very sparse at best. Now, um, a few people over the years have tried to take these apart. When you actually take the cartridge apart, there's no battery on the cartridge itself. So, not unlike the regular, you know, Super Famicom cartridges that would have battery backup on the cartridge itself, <coughs> this unfortunately doesn't have that. What it does have is a door to board that fits at the back of the system with a battery on it, which is hard soldered into the system. 
Now you would presume that by changing that battery, maybe it uses that battery to save games. I have actually done that in this system and I was documenting some of this on the Yam Yam page. So go there if you want to see about this. But uh, on the advice of somebody else who'd done it several years ago, somebody who's quite trusted in terms of modding machines and that, unfortunately changing that battery, um, it does work in that any changes you make to the BIOS screens, it will save those changes. So if you change the, the coinage or you change the free play length of time, or any of those kind of changes, it will hold and save those changes. Now I've changed the battery. Unfortunately, he does mention in his video that it will then make game saves work. According from what I can tell, and the research I've done, and all the tests I've done, I've tried two different battery holders now. I used a wired battery holder, which I mounted at the front to make changing a battery easier, uh, and then I actually changed that because I thought maybe it was losing something in current. Um, no. I've used an onboard, um, you know, quick change battery holder to, to make battery changing very easy. Put a brand new fresh battery on, tried a few different batteries. It only holds the BIOS information. It does not hold the game saves. So whether there's an option or something that I'm not setting that allows it to be found in information after power up, I don't, I mean, someone made the argument that maybe they didn't include game saving because the new people are going to play it all the time. The fact that they may be able to remember which games you've been to, the fact they chose games that have got game save files altogether, why wouldn't they just scrap all of that if they didn't want you to save your game? And why would it save it when you're switching between games? It doesn't make any sense. They would have just done away with it altogether. So I think there's maybe an option somewhere which will allow me to enable retaining game saves after power off, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm trying to get that working. I might need to consult with a few people on that. But from what I can tell, unfortunately, it doesn't save your game. That wouldn't be so much of a concern, but the type of games you've got here, you want it to save all the world being open on the Mario games. On Mario Kart, you want it to save the other cups being opened. You know, of course you do. The faster CC races, you can open up all of that stuff. But unfortunately, you know, I just haven't got, I haven't got that information... Uh, on how to do that so I, I, you know I can't retain that information and save those games on here so right now you can't save games on here at all so that function is just completely lost uh, unfortunately but at least you can play the games in their entirety just as they were on the uh, original SNES so that's the one saving grace and uh, yeah so obviously you've seen the games there some of the games here you've seen before so I'm not going into that too much but uh, I'll just quickly touch on some of the other modes that you've got on here. Now, on the front of the system, uh, you could see I'd actually got a key uh, for this system. The key didn't actually come with the console, unfortunately. The key was missing with this. Uh, but thankfully, I found somebody online in Australia who was selling replica keys for this. Uh, and I, I managed to order myself a key. It took a little while to come, which is why I delayed doing this. Uh, but it turns out I didn't actually need it. Um... The Super Famicom box, even though it's only got two uh, modes labelled there, on and off, those aren't actually the system being on or off. It's actually basically turning free play mode on or off. The off setting is actually putting it into full coin operation mode. And that is how most people would have seen it in the hotels, well, when the hotel set it up that way. But there's actually another, I think another four key position settings on here for operators. And uh, if you turn past the on, on switch there, or down past the off switch, you can actually activate a few more modes. And if I put it back on the screen, I'll show you a couple of those modes now. So, get back in, in, uh, in frame. So if I turn all the way to the right, that is completely off mode. That turns the box completely off. Uh, it doesn't turn it on with any kind of mode. If I go to the first stage... Give it a second to uh, boot up. This, I believe, puts it into a coin-operated mode that skips the bookkeeping, if I'm not mistaken. So this would be like a coin-operated mode, um, but it won't save any of your gameplay counters or anything like that. I think it was mainly used for testing purposes. Uh, because I haven't actually got the coin box hooked up, uh, it's not actually showing, um, you know, it won't actually work in the way it's supposed to work. 
Oh, sorry, this is the diagnostic mode. So you can see here we've actually got diagnost diagnostic mode. And these are actually in English, which is surprising because the entire rest of it is completely in Japanese, which is annoying because if you're going to put the rest of it in Japanese, why isn't this in Japanese? Do you know what I mean? So you can see here, real-time clock. Obviously, it's recognising real-time clock. And that will only work when you've got the, the battery hooked in. So why there's even a real-time clock is beyond me, unless it's just for the sake of record keeping and keeping the system time. Uh, it's showing that all the boards are working fine. So now there's nothing physically wrong with the system because all of the um, systems are showing that it's fine. So you can see there you've got slave backup RAM, the actual program ROM, which is the individual ROMs for the games. The backup RAM only is only for the BIOS. It doesn't seem to work. For the game saves so it's by well, the fact it's reporting all of these are working i can assume the system is fully working um but it just doesn't support the game saves unless i can find a manual somewhere for this and somebody can translate for me i just don't know there may be a menu option i can play around with but i don't want to mess around with them too much you can reset them all to factory settings but it's just something i don't know if i really want to mess with do you know what i mean and these are obviously the uh, system BIOS ROMs, the game ROMs. Uh, it's just testing all of those, making sure those are all reading and the uh, this, 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 the uh, header checks are all being done okay. Uh, someone did actually try to hack this many years ago when they were dumping it for the sake of MAME. Um, and uh, unfortunately, they couldn't get any other game to run on here. So there is some kind of encryption at work on here. So, and once it's actually done the checks, it just cycles them through and just shows them over and over again. So, we'll go to the next mode on the key switch. And this, I believe, should be the, uh, yeah, this is the money, this is the coin operated diagnostic free play mode. So, if I go into a game on here now, you can see we've now got a fifth option. And uh, I think this fifth option is like sample the game or something like that. So, if we go into it, and you can see we've actually now got a text overlay on the top or the bottom of the screen. That basically tells you, you know, you've got two minutes of free play before it actually resets back to the title screen. I believe it says. Um, a friend of mine's been translating this for me, but I haven't actually got the text file next to me right now to view that and see exactly what's going on. But yeah, it just tells you what the game title is and it just tells you, you know, insert coins to, you know, to play this fully. Um, it should reset back to title screen after so long. I think it lets it run a full demo. I think it runs a full circuit demo. Once it goes back to title screen, then it resets back to the menu. Could be wrong on that. We'll see. We'll just see if it runs. Let it run out. So, yeah, so you've got a few different modes on here. Uh, what's unfortunate for a lot of people who buy these systems, though, is when you actually pick up these systems, a lot of the information is, uh, sorry, a lot of the uh, stuff you need for it is actually missing. So the keys are often missing. The operator's key, nine times out of ten, is completely missing. And that completely sucks. However, oh, let's yeah, see, Donkey Kong's head's gone again. <laughs> I'll have to make sure this cartridge is inserted properly. But yeah, we'll skip off that mode anyway. Uh, the next stage, of course, is to on, and that is the full free play mode. That is what you would see me running it from, from the start. This is when it's completely unrestricted. I can go to any game. I can play any game for any length of time that I want to. And you can see if I go to a game now that that fifth option will be missing. There you go. See the difference there. Yeah, the difference between PAL and NTSE is massive, Alan. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to answer your question as well, Adrian, sorry about that. I don't actually have a Satella view at the moment. I went to pick one up several years ago, purely as a showpiece because they they weren't uh, they, they no longer work. But I've heard reports now that people are modifying them with um, with a uh, what's it called um, like a modem cable and allowing that they're going to run like a pseudo server to distribute games to the Satella view directly. Um, I've not so not delved into that more, but it means the price of Satella view systems has unfortunately gone up over time. The best thing, of course, is the few Satellaview games that are exclusive have been dumped and modified, and you can play those on Never Drive Cart, so that's quite good. So it's not high on my list of priorities right now, um, but I will pick up a Satellaview at some point. I could have gone for about 20 quid a couple of years ago, but sorry, I'll wait till then. 
But this, on the other hand, this is something that's truly unique. There's very few people who've got one of these, and I'm really proud to actually own it. Uh, so yeah, that is the on mode. Now the other mode, of course, if I flick over here um, and just go to diagnostic mode and then go to off, you get this funky intro, this little custom Kirby intro that introduces to the Super Famicom box. Now this is in full coin operated mode so uh, when it loads up it obviously you've got the same options we had in the diagnostic version we've got a different title screen music you can probably just about hear that and you can see that after a short while it automatically selects a game and runs uh, a demo version of it just basically showing you what it's all about and then it will cycle through those games and show each of those one at a time. Has Don Kong still got his head missing on this? <laughs> yeah, he's disappearing. I'll have to uh, I'll have to clean the contacts and make sure that's okay. But you should in a second go back to the the main thing and then go down to the next game and show that game being demoed for a short while. Yeah, that's what exactly what it's doing. There you go. So it goes back and you get this little intro here. I guess this is like the, the, the full attract mode, if you know what I mean. If you were sat in like a hotel or something, you've already got this on the background. It's just a way to entice you on to just try out the games, you know what I mean? Um, but I, I don't know how I'd have felt about paying 100 yen, you know, to have a couple of games. But then again, if you're bored, you've got nothing else to do, you know, accessing the ports on these TVs or taking your consoles back in the day wasn't easy. So I suppose it was just a nice, convenient way of doing it. From what I understand, a lot of the hotels in the end uh, decided not to even run them with the coin slot. They would simply put them into the on position and then what they would do is they would charge like a, a, maybe an extra additional amount on the room premium to allow you to have use of it. Or basically offset that in the room price and just have these in the rooms as a piece of entertainment for people. You know, they're very secure. They've got like a full steel front, a uh, full steel casing. They're, they're very well protected. So they were suitable for commercial use. So... Um, once they bought the games and that, you know, I suppose they paid for themselves if they offset it in the in the room prices. So it didn't really matter if you had a coin box on the side, and it saved, you know, the potential threat of people vandalising and taking the coins out or rigging them. You know, just just put it in the room, let people enjoy it. So it cycles through, and like I say, it'll go down them one at a time and show them off. But you can actually uh, you can actually go in and, and pick the game you want to any time you want. So I've tapped the joypad now and it's gone to the game selection mode. The music's changed and you can see you've got the options that we had before. But if I now go into the game, you can see there it says it says unless it's in the on position you'll have to pay for it. So I can't actually go into the game. But if I go down to the fifth option. This is when it tells you I can soft reset it and we now get a time restricted two minutes to play it just like we did in that other mode just. So we'll start up a game and in two minutes it should kick me back out to the title screen. Love Super Bomb Man 2. If you've never played Super Bomb Man 2 I highly recommend you do. The original Super Bomb Man was brilliant. The Super Bomb Man 2 is a really good game too. Got a few extra, few extra modes, a few extra options new arenas the single player modes a lot better oh, I'm killing myself there <laughs> should have left that as it was shouldn't I right, we'll kill that first and I've got somewhere to run and I think it will give me a warning when there's only a minute left to play as well we'll see in a second but I think the text at the top of the screen basically tells me that it's only running down. Like, there you go. Bottom of the screen there, you can see it means I've got one minute left to play before it resets. So at least you've got a chance to kind of try out the games as well. Even if you didn't have any money on you, you could jump in and have a, a very quick blast. And at least see what they were about before you uh, put your money in. Which was good, I suppose, if you'd never played these games before. I suppose at the point these were, these were out... 
most people had played these games. You know, the Super NES was very popular in Japan. Here you go, this is the 30 second countdown coming up now. I doubt I'll be able to finish a stage in that time, to be honest, because I'd have to destroy those and hit that switch, but let's try and speed it up. Get that one. So we'll get this dude. Come on, 10 seconds. Yeah, that'll kill him. Seven, six. Oh, he ran away from it, you git. He's trying to prove me wrong, isn't ya? Boom. And then kicks you back to the title screen. There we go. So you then get the option to go in, of course. If you've inserted coins at this point, you can go into there. You can now insert your coins and it will let you play. Otherwise, it's just in. Uh, it's just locked off to you and you can only play the two-minute demos. So I'm going to flip that back to on mode now. There you go. And you can see that final option disappears. If I go into the game now, you can see it lets me go in and just completely free play with no restrictions. So I can play this through from start to finish if I want to. So, um, yeah, what did bug me slightly, and I will not down the volume on this now. What did bug me slightly is, um, like I say, a lot of people have been messing around with these over time. And um, they have found out little hacks you can do on them and worked out what the different key positions and things were. What you can actually do with the lock on this, it's not like a high security lock. Uh, and it's very easy. Once you remove the face plate, you can actually completely unscrew and you can take apart the tumbler on the lock and you can remove a couple of plates in there. And then basically, you can actually turn the lock position just by jamming a screwdriver or a coin or something in there and turning it. Now, because I didn't want to damage my system, like a fool, I didn't attempt to do that when it first arrived. So I ordered the key, which cost me like 20 quid to come from Australia, because uh, I wanted to operate it properly, you know, do it all properly, and hopefully I'll be able to get uh, a barrel lock key at some point to replace the missing ones to be able to use the locks again. Um, but I went ahead and, and took the plunge with that and basically paid to get one of these. So I didn't know anybody else who had one, so I couldn't just burn my own, you know, you know sorry, um, burn my own. I couldn't get my own key cut for it. So I ordered one from Australia, when it came, I actually realised on the day it came, after using it a couple of times, this lock's already been modified. So somebody in Japan has already taken the tumbler apart and made it free play. So I, I didn't actually need to do that. You don't actually need to buy a key. You can very easily do it yourself. But if you want to use it properly and you don't want to damage and chew up the lock mechanism too much, it's good to have a key. Now I've got this key. If anybody else does have a system, I'd be quite happy as long as you pay for it, of course, to basically go and get another key cut so I could send you a key and then you can then obviously have your own proper key for the front of this and that way you're not tuning it up by jamming in the screwdriver and turning it every time you want to go to the other options. So, of course, the last thing, obviously, to show you on here is if I go all the way to the left now, this is the option mode for it. So we've got a few different options here. Um... All of these screens, a lot of people don't really know what they do. And I did try messing, and unfortunately, I, I managed to screw up a few options. But thankfully, I found the option that allows you to reset the BIOS completely. So uh, that returned everything to normal. Because you can change the setting on here, where when you go to free play mode, it's no longer actually in proper free play mode. And I was like, oh shit, I've, I've got, I had free play mode, and I've gone ahead and broke it by messing around. Uh, thankfully, now you can reset the BIOS and, and do away with that. Um, but this is how I know my battery is actually holding um, the changes I'm making because I made those changes with the battery changing uh, and it's, it's so, it kept all my, my, my settings even after power off but it doesn't keep the game saved. So unless somebody knows what they're doing and could find some way to hold those game saves, maybe add some kind of battery saving on the actual cartridge itself or do some kind of modification, game saving unfortunately won't work, which is a bit of a pisser. Um, but maybe in time as more people get their hands on these you know if anybody out there is on my friends list or is watching this knows what they're doing and is willing to kind of go into these and have a really good poke around maybe they can go in and work out how to do it or maybe modify the cartridges or the system itself to allow game saves to save that would be absolutely awesome um, as it stands we can't actually save games but we can at least fiddle around so you've got a few options here. I think the first one, yeah, this is where you can actually see the play count. And you can see 
that even though I've had this turned completely off at the wall um, and it lost all of my game saves, it has actually kept and it's logged uh, what games I played, the amount of turn, times I launched that game and um, I think it gives a total players at the bottom. Um, you can reset that if you want to. Uh, number two is where most of your options are. So here you can actually set the time and the date. I haven't actually done that as of yet because I've been messing around and I've had the board out on this. So it's been shown at the moment. Um, I think the first one's the year. Yeah, the first one's the year. And then the second one, I think, is the uh, month. And the last one is the actual day. And then the time at the end. I did set that at one point, but um, I've set it at the wrong time of day. And I had the board out since. So that's wrong. I will change that to be right. Um, you've got a couple of options you can set here. Um, I, like I say, I haven't got the data sheet here next to me, but a friend of mine called Michael, he lives in Japan, he actually helped hook me up with a switchable Japanese plug bank because I couldn't actually get one over here. Uh, he helped me out with that a couple of years ago. He helped me out again with this, and he's now translating all of these pages because it's not documented fully online. And only a couple of people who've done videos speaks Japanese. He's actually gone through, and I've sent him screenshots of all of these all of these uh, pages, and he's done a full translation for me. So at, at some point, um, I'm going to write those up and, and save those as pictures so people can use it as a reference guide, and I will upload those online. So anybody else who gets one of these systems and I want to mess with the settings, they can use my reference points, and, yeah, you can thank me for that later. So, yeah, you can change a few things there, and you can change to coin-operated or not. Um, I think that's the options for that. Um, here you can do run a test on the TV, um, so you can change to output through AV or RF. Um, you can actually check something there, but it says the AV is not plugged in, which obviously it's not because there's no TV attached to it. Um, there's a couple of flags here you can set to on or off, I think it is, um, but I'm not again I'm not going to mess with those because I don't want to change any of my settings right now. Uh, the fourth option is always return to last menu. Um, and then, again, there's some more settings here related to coinage. Um, so you can basically set the length of time that a coin gives you when you actually put a coin in. You can change the length of the demo modes. Uh, you can change how long the free play mode lasts for if you've got in free play mode. So you could have it in free play mode, for example, but you could limit it to, say, 10 minutes of free play. So, you know, that, that's another way of kind of giving flexibility there to the people who operate the hotels or whatever and use these systems as to how they want to charge people. They could just have, you know, you put a credit card thing in and then they will come and unlock it for you or change the setting. Uh, but, yeah, there's a lot of options there for it. Um, trying to think what the cell. I've got all these documented, but I don't know what they are. That is to reset the BIOS. Um, I don't need to do that. I've got it set up the way I like. And then... Yeah, you can see there, I think this actually, this is the input checks. Even though we had the uh, the input check, the diagnostic mode on earlier, which is all in English, when you go to it in the menus, you can see there, that is actually controller 1 at the top and controller 2. It's checked that they're okay, uh, but you can go in and test the individual functions of those if you want to. So if I, I'm not going to do it because I can't remember how to get back out of it. But if you go into it, you can actually check that all the buttons and D-pad and everything's working fine. Same with the buttons on the uh, front of the system. And you can see there the ROM check. It just tells you what ROM version you're running and if there's any errors with it and things like that. So, yeah, so those are your diagnostic options. But, yeah, we'll just drop it back into a track mode for now. So, yeah, so the Super Famicom box anyway. I mean, this has been quite a long video because I've quite a lot to cover in it. It's a very interesting system. Now, the reason... Um, I find it so interesting, like I say, is because I was a big fan of the SNES. The SNES is my favourite console ever. And obviously, I wanted to have something that is SNES related. It's official Nintendo, you know. Um, and, you know, it's playing... It's got some of the best games on here. You know, you can't deny Super Mario All Stars, Mario Kart, you know, Donkey Kong Country, Bomberman. They are all, you know, A-grade games for the system. There's no shit on there, you know what I mean? I mean, yes, I could have had cartridges in there that play fucking Mahjong and golf, and nobody wants to mess around with those. Um, but, yeah, they would have had appeal in Japan, you know, so I can understand that. Um, but at least um, at least you've got top games on here. Now, they never released any more games for the system, probably because 
Um, the games that were on there are probably sufficient for their use at the time. It would have been nice to have had more choice or to have able to, enabled them to make it so you could use original SNES cartridges maybe. Uh, it would have added a bit more variety, but I think they wanted to control just where the hotels obtain their games from and also make the system, being Nintendo, uncopyable. You know, it wasn't easy to read or rip these games. It wasn't easy to duplicate the boards because they were custom. They had full control, and so if they wanted these servicing, they had to go straight back to Nintendo to have it done. The unfortunate side of that is, being Nintendo the way they are, documentation on these systems isn't really out there. Um, you can still find these systems fully boxed, from what I understand, um, but it's very rare to do. I know that Alan McCluskey had a, a box one for sale not long ago. I don't know if that included instructions. It would be nice if somebody has got one out there. If somebody out there does own one of these and does have the manual for this, I would love it if you could actually contact me because I've got somebody out there who can do a full translation on it and maybe that can uh, kind of shed some light on exactly what's going on and maybe help us unlock you know, new features in this or find new ways of maybe getting the game saves working or something like that. Um, but there are videos out there if you do want to do modifications yourself. There's a couple of people online, like I say, who've already kind of taken these apart, which has helped me, you know, allowed me to change the battery and service this thing, you know. Um, obviously, get it running without a key, which is handy. Being able to get in it, which is handy. Also, wouldn't be able to change the cartridges in there. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of information out there. you just got to kind of work together when it comes to something this rare and, and get it working. So, I suppose the $64,000 question is, what's it going to cost to get one of these? Right, well, I can tell you straight away that um, it's not going to be cheap. It's, it's just far from going to be cheap. The going rate, and I know there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, well, I picked up one of these on a, a random auction back in the day. It cost me 50 quid. Fair play to you if you did. Good luck to you. A lot of people did that. I've got things here that are high value and they're going for cheap. My arcade machines are managed to get cheap. They're going for loads of money again now. Let's not go and boast about that. We're talking about collector's prices right now, 2020, right? As it stands, um, one of these systems, loose, is going to set you back anywhere from probably five, six hundred pounds to about a thousand pounds if you're going to pick one of these up. They are not cheap by a long shot. You may find some people selling them on eBay, which is a bit hit or miss with eBay being eBay. Uh, if you find someone in the UK who's selling one, uh, it's going to it's going to cost you you know seven eight hundred pounds to buy one of these loose. If you find someone in Japan selling one, you're going to be paying anywhere between five and six hundred pound, and then you've got to factor in the shipping. And when the shipping comes in, you'll also have to pay VAT and customs clearing charges when it gets to the UK. So, you're, again, you're going to be paying about six, £700 to get to the UK. My advice, if you're going to want to get one of these, is to go somebody who imports regularly and does it well. Go to someone like Alan's Japan Retro Game Sales, because Alan McCluskey, he really, is, he really is the shit when it comes to this kind of thing. He will import them safely or make sure they're cleared. He'll get them cleaned up. He knows what he's buying, and he's the kind of guy who will really help you out if you've got a problem. Um, and if you're going to want to get one of these in safely, like I say, they're not the easiest things to ship. And people in Japan are notoriously bad at packaging things badly for international shipping. Um, so, yeah, that's my advice if you're going to want to get one. But be prepared to pay for, through the nose for it. Uh, it'll be a fair price for what they have to go through, but, yeah, you're going to pay for it. If you're going to want to try and get one of the cheapest value you can... What you're going to need to go to, into is the world, the shady world of uh, Japanese proxy bidding. Uh, that is basically using Japanese auctions and using a proxy bidder to place bids for you in Japan and uh, all the risks that that entails. Now, I'm going to be doing a video on that pretty soon. I didn't actually go through that process for this, but I nearly did. Um, I didn't want to take the risk myself. But I have been dabbling in that world very recently and I've picked up some brilliant things from Japan for bargain prices. You just have to kind of show a little faith and use your head and get things here safely and you can pick up some amazing bargains that way. And because everybody's been really hush-hush about it, it's a bit like Fight Club. You know, first rule of uh, Japanese auction club is you don't talk about Japanese auction club. And I had to go and do the research myself, myself 
and I'm not going to be selfish. There's other collectors out there who want to pick up this stuff. I'm going to show you how to go and pick up this stuff straight from Japan if you want to do it. Uh, if you're willing to get, deal with all the things that that involves. Um, I'm not going to undermine the works of people like um, Sore Thumb or um, AJRGS because they know their stuff a lot better and they will get your stuff here safely for a fair price when they import stuff. But uh, if you do want to take the risk of getting something really obscure, a one-off, I'm going to show you how to go about that, where to look and what kind of charges you're going to be looking at and all the things you're going to be dealing with. Uh, but that's a video for another day. Uh, as it happens, my Super Famicom box, and this is where I'm going to really annoy some people now who have been hunting for these. This system cost me, and it made the team sick when I told them, £362 all in. And that was bought just you know a few weeks ago. During uh, you know, a pandemic and whatever, it cost me £362 to buy loose. And that's in the condition you see in here. A lot of these don't arrive in fantastic condition. The worst thing you'll find with them a lot of the time is the case itself will be scratched where you can see that mine is pretty well done. There's now big scratches on there. You'll find that the front has been demolished. Now you can see quite a few marks on this, but as, you, as I showed in my pictures, it's not too bad. The controllers are in fantastic condition. They're not all yellowed. Um, the locks haven't been hammered. What people try to do with these is they try to prise the front off. And this has probably been attempted with this, but not too much. The reason that doesn't work is because there's actually a metal steel reinforced plate behind the plastic front, which prevents you from doing that. So when people try to prise these open, they end up breaking the front. And what had actually happened with this is um, the plastic on this side here had been completely snapped off. But was still in the box the plastic on this side was actually kind of loose on the corner and i damaged a little bit on the top when i was prizing this thing open but thankfully all the pieces of plastic were there so literally just got on it with some super glue and i touched it up and where it was damaged yeah all you can see there now is just a little bit of scratching on the surface you know typical use from its commercial use just like you get with an arcade machine or anything of that description um, but the rest of it, you know, it, it's all there. All the plastics are there and it's not completely demolished. Yes, yeah, there's a little bit of wear there by the uh, by the buttons. Yeah, there's a little bit of crap on there. I've just put on there myself, I think. I'll just wipe that off. Um, but yeah, it does need a bit of a clean up because I've had it sat on this table for a couple of weeks. So I've probably got a bit of my dinner on it. Um, and yes, there's a little bit of wear there where it says reset. But I can always add a little label there. I could probably print a little label and add that to it because that's all these are is printed labels. Um, but the, the full logo is still there and operationally it's tip top it's working exactly as it should do I've changed the battery in there so I'm really happy about that and like I say I got this for the bargain price by the time it got all the way to England I got this here for £362 which is a fucking steal for this system like I say you're going to be paying more than twice that if you get it from anywhere else so even though it's not cheap by a long shot it was a bargain I couldn't miss I didn't actually plan on buying this. I was actually going to get one from Alan because I knew he had one coming. Um, but when I saw this come up, it came up on a badly worded um, eBay auction as it happened. And thankfully it turned up and I contacted the guy and it was actually going for a little bit more than that. But it came with the worst cartridge that I talked about. And I said, well, let's forget about that cartridge and give me a bit of a discount. And that's exactly what he did. He took a bit off. And then when, he actually had two or three of these. And when he came to ship it, he said, um, oh, I've just realised I've not got any keys left for this one. I said, oh, well, it's going to cost me a fortune to get into it, so knock me some more money off. So I managed to knock him down by, like, I think it was 70 quid I knocked him down by. Uh, and uh, in the end, I actually got him to send it by express shipping. So he actually skipped the customs process. So he got here, and basically, when it, went, when it arrived, it literally only took, I think it was uh, nine days from Japan to arrive here. And uh, bypassed the customs and everything and uh, got it here for that price. So I'm really happy about that. If you're going to get one, be prepared to pay a little bit for it. Um, yes, there's, uh, it's got a few little niggles, but nothing I'm going to lose any sleep over. For all intents and purposes, it's a really good example of the system. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy with it. If there's some way in the future of getting game saves working, I would absolutely love that. But uh, if there's not, you know, I can deal with it. It's a rare piece, you know, I'm really proud to own. 
and uh, it's probably now my favourite piece in, in my collection because I'm now starting to really delve into the rare stuff and I've got quite a few rare systems already but this is kind of top of the pile for me because the snow has been my favourite system ever and uh, yeah I know it's something that not many people out there have got so but anyway guys I've rambled on now for close to an hour and a half about this um, sorry if I've bored you silly I know, I know I tend to ramble when I do these things but I've always got so much to say and I just like to get it out and you can see that I've I'm obviously passionate about what I'm talking about here, and uh, this system really is something special. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video anyway, guys. Very soon I'll be doing my video talking about Japanese auctions, and I'll also be doing some videos on some of the things I've picked up through Japanese auctions, as well as some things that friends have also given to me or lent to me that they want me to talk about on videos. So I've got some wicked new videos coming up, and I've checked online. There aren't actually a lot of videos on the things I'm going to be covering, this is probably the first video on the Super Famicom box to be uploaded to YouTube in probably 10 years. So it's more concise than a lot of the ones that have been on so far. And uh, I'm hopefully it'll be a good reference point for anybody looking to pick up their own system or thinking of buying one at least. But I uh, hope you enjoyed it, guys. Um, I'm going to go and enjoy the rest of my, my day now. And uh, I'll probably uh, polish this up and package this away now until... Um, probably event time or until I get any more information on uh, translating it or getting game saves working but uh, yeah for now guys I'm signing off and I'll catch you soon enjoy your weekend and uh, I will see you real soon that's that